certainly appreciate this morning being reminded of the physical sufferings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the things that in a physical way that certainly He endured there. But of course we know and understand from Isaiah the prophecy that was given in Isaiah 53 deals with a lot concerning uh, of the foretelling of what the Lord Jesus Christ would certainly go through. I think of the verse there in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11 that says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Amen. Notice that. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. I believe that God the Father saw of the travail of God the Son, of His very soul, His very being. And to me that goes in harmony and helps with Jesus saying from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Brother Rick, I've always kind of expressed it this way. That at that point in time, God, notice he didn't say my father, my father. He said my God, my God. That the almighty God withdrew all strength, comfort, and help. All comfort and strength and help from his servant. Aren't we thankful that the servant of the Lord, and that's Jesus Christ, the one prophesied, the right arm of the Lord, the servant of, the, of God. And that from him was withdrawn strength and comfort and all help and all aid was withholding from him that he could feel the very brunt, that he could feel the very uh, sharpness uh, that he could feel all of the agony and the torment and the pain that was required yeah. to satisfy the holy indignation of Almighty God. Amen. And God did not turn his back when, when, when he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I've heard folks say that God turned his back. Uh, from his son. God didn't turn his back. God never took his eyes off the offering. God never took his eyes off to be satisfied with seeing it come to fruition of that that truly was coveted together in the thrice holy God, in the three in one God before the very foundation of the world wherein the very Son of God did agree in that covenant, that everlasting covenant of grace to come and to suffer and to go through with what he went through. And this is part of what the apostles preached. This is what part of what the apostles uh, held forth to of the gospel that they proclaimed of the Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, this is certainly a uh, part of... Uh, uh, as we introduced and spoke from the subject matter last Sunday there in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They stayed firm. They held fast. There, there was no change in their attitude or their aim uh, those that were uh, converted uh, to the way of the Lord Jesus Christ there on the day of Pentecost, uh, they did not alter, they did not turn. Uh, they continued, they were firm, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, as we understand this, this subject matter of, of steadfastness and, and of endurance and perseverance, uh, and laying hold upon and enduring. Uh, that's in the same sense as the Apostle Paul uh, told Timothy to endure, to endure hardness. Uh, amen. As we said some Sundays ago, uh, preaching there 
uh, concerning the militant church, uh, uh, that we have a militant God, that one side, one aspect of God is that he is the Lord of Sabaoth, that he is a militant God, the Lord of hosts, uh, and that his church is a militant church that is, is composed and made up of soldiers. Uh, and the apostle Paul said, endure hardness. Uh, endure the hardness uh, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, so, and then, then, of course, we brought the scripture in. I believe it was in James 5 and 11 uh, that says, happier they that endure. Uh, happier they that endure. There is a great blessing uh, to God's servants when we endure, when we stay steadfast and firm in the way of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the things of the gospel and the gospel kingdom, uh, the church of Christ while we live uh, here upon this earth. Now, to me, this being steadfast and continuing and persevering and laying hold upon and continuing in uh, also is in the same uh, sense. It's in the same category, I think, as the Scripture describes in the Gospel when Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 12 uh, and verse uh, 13. And uh, let's, let's look there in verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. But now I want you to notice Jesus, he wasn't talking about or saying to them, uh, that, uh, that the law uh, or that as far as the, the principles, we know the ceremonial law was fulfilled in Christ, uh, uh, but the commandments of God, the way of God, the things that Jesus taught, uh, the things in the, in the law and in the Psalms and the prophets, because when Jesus said along the same lines in Luke chapter 16, in verse 16, the law and the prophets were until John, since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. So you see that expression. When Jesus had said that uh, about the law and the prophets were unto John, uh, when he made this point, the very next point that he made was to reaffirm and, and, and to uh, stop if they got the notion if they got the idea uh, that the law was uh, passing away, that the commandments of God and all that God had commanded and said uh, from, the, from the beginning of time up until then, that if it was done away with, Jesus said it's easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. In other words, it's, it's not f passing. It's not, it's not, it's not failing. What's the point that Jesus is making that the law and the prophets were unto John? That's that old economy. Uh, that's that uh, uh, under the law service. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the divine worship service of Almighty God. Uh, under uh, the law service, it was fulfilled. All the types, all the shadows, all that pointed to Jesus. Uh, Jesus fulfilled that. Uh, Amen. Uh, but we understand also as Jesus gave the expression and said, I've not come uh, to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Uh, now I've heard people turn right around and use a double negative there and change that uh, by giving the sense of it uh, that when Jesus said that he fulfilled it, he did away with it. Uh, I, he said, I haven't come to destroy it, but to destroy it. Uh, now, that's not what he said. He said, I, I've not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Amen. To bring it to its highest potential. Uh, amen. To keep it. Uh, to appease uh, my heavenly father. Uh, he kept it in our room and our stead. Uh, but yet, uh, it was as a schoolmaster to bring us unto God. To bring us unto Christ. It pointed unto him. It showed forth uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but I want you to notice this expression here in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. 
It is uh, this, this expression that says suffereth violence. It's the same uh, translation from the Greek uh, as, as it is uh, there in Luke chapter 16 where it's translated uh, presseth, presseth uh, into it. And it's, the, it's from the same Greek word that's translated here in Matthew chapter 11 that says suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. What is Jesus uh, teaching here in both places? Uh, to me, it's a little bit plainer in Luke chapter 16 and 16. Let the scripture interpret the scripture uh, uh, when he says uh, that the kingdom is preached, the kingdom of God is preached, uh, and every man presseth into it. Uh, uh, there in Matthew, he said that the violent take it by force. Uh, what is he saying? He is saying uh, that we must uh, fight, that we must be aggressive, uh, that we must lay hold upon, uh, that we must be steadfast uh, to lay hold upon the kingdom of heaven, to lay hold upon on the gospel. This is not talking about heaven and immortal glory. It's talking about, uh, amen, the kingdom of God right here on this earth. The kingdom of heaven that Christ is the king of. Uh, uh, kingdom of heaven. Uh, kingdom of God is one and the same. Uh, it is uh, God's kingdom. He is king of it. Uh, uh, kingdom of heaven is from the mother country. It is from heaven. Kingdom of heaven is a messianic term uh, used uh, 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 pr primarily and set forth in Matthew's writing. Matthew, uh, to me, in writing the gospel, was a Jew presenting her king unto the Jews. Uh, it's written from that type perspective. Uh, uh, but the kingdom of heaven, the law and the prophets were no John, but now it's the gospel of the kingdom preached. Uh, and every man presseth uh, into it. Uh, this is that steadfastness. Uh, this is that continuance. Uh, this is that endurance. Uh, this is that laying hold upon. Uh, uh, this gives us the picture. It paints the picture unto us uh, uh, that is uh, uh, not done or comes about in a lazy fashion. Uh, it's not done from a haphazard uh, uh, way of doing things. Uh, but it is deliberate. Amen. It's deliberate. It's with precision. Uh, it's with knowledge. Uh, it is with determination. Uh, it is with that mindset. Uh, as we talked about last Sunday, of uh, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, and it was a mindset of obedience because it gives us a context because it goes uh, through there in those verses uh, and uh, teaches us uh, uh, concerning the obedience uh, of the man, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, what were they doing on the day of Pentecost uh, right before uh, 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 they had been, before they were baptized, Peter was preaching to them there in Acts chapter 2. Uh, and uh, he says in verse 40, and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourself. Now, if, you're, if you were trying to save yourself from something or save yourself from someone, uh, you would be doing it uh, uh, in an expedient way. You would be doing it uh, in a precision way. You would be laying hold upon it. Uh, you might have to be contending. If you were fighting for your life, you might have to be doing physical combat and so forth. Uh, Peter says, save yourself. What is he telling them? The same thing. Jesus said but now every man presseth into it when he was saying save yourself he was telling them to press into the kingdom of God he was telling them to be violent to be forceful to fight to lay hold upon not to, to be deterred from the from the mission not to be uh, go aside or, or to uh, be distracted uh, from what they were doing I tell you there's so many distractions Attractions in the world. <coughs> Excuse me. There are so many distractions. <coughs> Excuse me, that water went down the wrong way. 
There are so many distractions that this flesh, that the world system, that the God of this world, that we war against, <clears throat> that would endeavor to sift us, even as Jesus told Peter, that Satan desires to, to sift you as wheat, but nevertheless I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. We have much to contend with, brethren. We have much opposition from and distractions from the world, from our Adamic nature, from Satan uh, that would endeavor to distract us and to get us to go astray. <clears throat> but as he told them to save themselves from this untoward generation, then in verse 41 it says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So as they heeded the message that Peter was preaching to them, and they began to press, and they began to violent, take it by force, to be violent, to be uh, aggressive, uh, to be laying hold upon, uh, to, to fight this good fight of faith. Uh, it's, it's the same as, as we hear the Apostle Paul there in 1 Corinthians, that 15th chapter and verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now I want, to, I want to turn over to Titus and we'll look here for just a few moments. But as Titus is responding there in chapter 1 where the Apostle Paul is telling him about ordaining bishops and ordaining elders in every city he said, as I had appointed thee. And he goes into the qualifications of a bishop. And then as he comes on down to verse 9, he says of the bishop, one being ordained to that office, he says, holding fast. Holding fast. This is the same thing as steadfastness. Steadfastly. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. You know, Brother Rick, that was one thing you were bringing out about uh, how that if the uh, apostles, uh, if they had actually been making up uh, uh, those things, that they would have certainly left that out. Uh, uh, and, but, but I, and I thought of this verse right here, uh, that this is one of the things uh, that we are to do and to convince the gainsayers, those that says, well, this is not the truth. Uh, this is not uh, the way that it was. Uh, that we, by uh, sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers by the soundness, by that of the inspired Word of God, that we take it, that we lay hold upon it, that we be steadfast with it. And this is what the bishop, uh, the elder, the teacher uh, is to do, is hold him fast the faithful word as he has been taught, uh, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Uh, and then notice as we go down into chapter, chapter 2, as by the Spirit, the Apostle Paul continues and says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. This word become, it means to adorn. Speak the things which adorn sound doctrine. Speak the things which beautify sound doctrine. You know, by us speaking the truth doesn't make it the truth. Uh, so that's not what this is saying. It doesn't say uh, that what you speak, uh, that it would make it the truth because you speak it. No, it says, but speak thou the things which become, which adorn sound doctrine. And then, then he goes into uh, the things of, 
uh, aged men, aged women, young men, and, and, uh, and, and young women, and servants, and so forth. Uh, uh, but there in verse verse 8, you see that expression again, sound speech. This is the apostles' doctrine, which is sound speech. Then in verse 10, uh, it gives us that definition, that the reason that I believe the sense of it, uh, there in chapter 2 and verse 1, but speak thou the things which become or which adorn sound doctrine, when he, when he says, not for longing but shewing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. To adorn the doctrine, to beautify the doctrine. And this is to be steadfast in the doctrine. We're not authorized, amen, to teach or to preach anything but the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Timothy, uh, the apostle, said that very familiar expression, preach the word. Amen. That's what we're to do is to preach the word. A uh, sound in word. A uh, sound in the teaching. Uh, when, it, when it says that they continue steadfastly in the apostles' uh, uh, doctrine, that word doctrine means teaching. That, that's, that's what it just simply means. They continued in the apostles' uh, uh, teaching. It was sound teaching. It was what they had received uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they had heard the Lord preach and teach for three and a half years. They had been with Him. It wasn't that they had a doctrine in and of themselves. When it says the apostles' doctrine, it's not that they took credit for it. It's not that they were the originator of it. It wasn't that they were the begetter of it. Uh, no, uh, it was the, the apostles' doctrine because that was the doctrine, that was the teaching that they taught. But they had received that teaching from Jesus. They had received that teaching from the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that good ministers, uh, amen, will teach what thus saith the word of God. And the word of God exhorts us, amen, and teaches us to encourage God's people to be steadfast and to hold forth sound uh, doctrine. Uh, here is, is part of that when he goes on uh, there, that last part of verse 10, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things for the grace of God. Why? Because the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Oh, this is what they were to stay steadfast in and continue in, was the exhortation and the teaching that right here in this present world, that God's people, the, the, the disciples of Jesus Christ, should live soberly should live righteously and godly right here, right here in this present world. And he tells God's people in verse 8, Titus chapter 3, to, in this being steadfast and in being faithful, that we, in doing that, might be careful to maintain good works these things are good and profitable unto men. This is good, this is profitable unto us that we maintain good works. The scriptures, the, the apostles' doctrine that we're to remain in, that we're to be steadfastly in, they teach us and tell us what good works are. And we understand and know that we have been ordained unto good works. We know that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk, that we should walk in them. That's action. That's putting them in action. You know, this, this way of Christianity, this way of following the Lord Jesus Christ, it is an action way. It is uh, an exercising way. It, it is a focused way. Uh, it, it's not just any old way. It's not a haphazardous way. Just any old thing won't do. It, has, it is that which is 
given to us, it is that which is laid down in God's uh, precious, precious word unto us. You know, uh, in, in second, the second epistle of Peter, there in chapter 1, he, going through this, I just want you to notice the first part of expression in five, and besides this, given all diligence. Then he goes into all these things that we're to add to. And, and I, want, I want you to notice, he says, add to your faith virtue. He doesn't say any words to add faith. You can't add faith. Faith is given. Now, that, that's a point that is strongly brought out right here. You add to your faith. Faith is given to you. And he goes through these things that you add these things to. But the point I want you to see there is, he says, giving all diligence. That is the steadfastness. Yeah. That is the enduring. That is the continuance. Yeah. That is the pressing. That is the violent take it by force. Yeah. Amen. Being aggressive to lay hold upon the kingdom of God. And not turn it loose. No matter what our adversary says. No matter what the old flesh says. That we continue on by the great grace and help of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then when he says given all this diligence and adding these things. He goes into verse 8. And what does he tell us? He says for if these things be in you and abound. They make you. They make you, that's strong language, isn't it? They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we add these things, if we continue in these things, it will make us fruitful. We won't be unfruitful, but we'll be fruitful in what? In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did they continue steadfastly in? The apostles' doctrine. The teachings that the apostles taught them after Peter had told them to save themselves from this untoward generation. And then he tells them uh, in verse 9 here in 2 Peter chapter 1, but he that lacketh these things, in other words, if you don't add these things and you lack these things, you're blind, cannot see afar off, this is not physical, but it's in a spiritual sense. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. If we don't continue to add these things, if we don't be steadfast, we can forget that we've been purged from our old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. This is not to make it sure to God. God's the one that did the election and the calling to start with. It's sure to you. Amen. Make your calling and election sure. In other words, if you add these things, if you're fruitful in the service of God, if you continue to lay hold upon it, this is evidence. This is good evidence. Oh, and what does it do in your, in your uh, heart, in your mind, uh, by faith? Uh, uh, you feel that assurance uh, uh, that you are among the elect of God, that you have been called out of nature's darkness, uh, and that you have heeded the gospel call, and that you're walking in the light as he is in the light and having uh, fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's telling us, give diligence. Give diligence. He said back here in verse 5, giving all diligence. And then he reaffirms this. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You give the diligence. You pursue. You lay hold upon to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. If you do these things, if you add these things that he gives this list through here, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity. 
For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we be diligent in that, we'll make our call and election sure, that assurance in our heart and our mind. And we, he said, ye shall never fall. Ye shall never fall. Now that's, that's a pretty strong positive, isn't it? That's a pretty strong pro- po- positive that ye shall never fall. So, and he continues on about continue to put us in, in remembrance of these things that we don't neglect them. The Lord bless you this morning is, is my prayer. I pray this morning that you've been blessed during this hour. We certainly appreciate those things that Brother Rick brought before us. We'll stand together, publish the open door of the church.